going to talk about something very topical, big data. Um, who here has not heard of big data? <laughs> um, so yeah, we're going to talk a little bit about, uh, about uh, you know, what is big data and cutting through some of the hype. Um, talk about uh, something called Hadoop, uh, which is uh, the current kind of standard for processing large amounts of data on clusters of computer, computers. Uh, and then talk about Apache Spark, which um, is the next generation, in my opinion, um, of Hadoop and, and big data processing. Uh, with a focus on Python, uh, as you'll see, uh, uh, Spark supports many languages, but Python is one of them, and it's a key uh, uh, first-class citizen. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about PySpark internals um, and the way that it's uh, that Java and Scala and Python actually interrupt uh, in Spark because it's kind of interesting um, and a little bit tricky. And then, sort of conclusion: I'm not sure quite how long it's all going to take. If we have time, I might have a, a live demo which might be interesting. And I'll try to get to that. So, big data. Everyone is talking about it. Um, you know, it's uh, it's everywhere. We've got you know big data on the brain. There's big data wave. If you don't catch it, you know you're going to be in trouble. You need to get on that surfboard and surf that binary, right? <laughs> We're floating in a sea of big data. See a binary. <laughs> See a binary. Um, there's gremlins in the big data. Yeah. So you know we've, we've got to navigate in this boat uh, on, uh, on waves of data. So it's the dawn of big data. You know, everything you read at the moment is about uh, the amount of data that we're going to be drowning in. So there is a lot of hype. Um, some of it is rubbish, but there is. You know what's happened to my title? Huh. Sorry guys, I'm going to... So there's a lot of hype out there, um, but there is a reason for, for some of it. So we're going to cut through a little bit of the hype. Um, so what is, what, you know, what is driving all this data? I mean, is it, you know, where does it suddenly come from? Right. In fact, it was always there. Um, what we're talking about here is, uh, you know, it's, it's sensor data, it's user behavior data online and, and in the real world, tracked by mobile, mobile phones. Uh, it's not like all this stuff was not there, it's just that now we can actually collect it. Um, so, you know, Moore's Law, the cost of compute, RAM, storage. <laughs> Obviously, replacing, replacing the dongle. <laughs> doesn't like uh, doesn't like big data. Uh, hopefully that'll work. Okay, so, um, so so uh, we can we can obviously compute on a lot of this data that we couldn't before. We can store it. Uh, storage is cheap, so we now can collect a lot of it. Um, and obviously, in addition, you know, we've now got mobile wearables, the Internet of Things. Again, more hype, but which is a lot of truth to it. We're collecting a lot more of this data than we were before. And obviously, you know, CERN and SCAR and these, uh, these science projects put anything you know, that we have on the web uh, or internet of things or wearables to share in terms of the sheer volume. Um, so we're getting all this data. We can now store, uh, store it cheaply. Um, and we've moved from a, a paradigm, I guess, where it used to be, well, what should I store? And um, I should choose exactly what to store and store the most valuable pieces of data to. Well, I'm going to store everything because it's cheap and easy, and I'm going to pretty much figure out what to do with it afterwards. So, 
the old paradigm was, was again, you know, choose what you store. Uh, now it's store everything. The old paradigm was, um, you know, throw more and more tin, scale vertically, uh, add RAM, add, add disk. Uh, the new paradigm is scale horizontally, and, and that's where Hadoop comes in. Uh, so we need to talk a little bit about Hadoop before we talk about Spark. So you know, Google was doing big data before it was cool, um, and occasionally they, you know, when they're, when they're done with the technology, they, uh, they release it to the rest of us, um, and we get to build you know, some open source equivalent of it. And then a few years later, they, they come along and make it obsolete. Um, and that's pretty much what happened. So in 2003, they published the Google File System paper, which became uh, the Apache uh, Hadoop distributed file system, HDFS. Um, you know, for storing large amounts of data on clusters of commodity computers uh, with replication, fault tolerance, failover. Uh, together with that, Google MapReduce, uh, which is a way of distributing uh, computation across clusters of computers. Uh, computers. So again, instead of uh, you know, shipping the code to the data, shipping the computation to the data instead of bringing the data <coughs> to the computation, and doing that split up into many, many tasks across clusters of computers. Uh, that became Apache Hadoop MapReduce. Uh, similarly, Bigtable uh, became Apache HBase, and Dremel uh, became Apache Drill. So, pretty much all the Apache big data projects have come from Google Papers. So, Hadoop started at Yahoo, uh, and it was actually named after Doug Cutting's uh, son's toy elephant. <laughs> um, you know, and obviously, every open source project needs to have a strange name with a, with a background story. Uh, so they built it, they, they took the, the MapReduce paper and the, the Google File System paper, built Hadoop, um, so their equivalent internally at Yahoo, and then, luckily for all of us, decided to completely open source it, give it away. Um, and that spawned an entire industry. Uh, Cloudera, MapR, to name two of the, the big guys who now do, you know, the, the, the red hat of big data in a way, you know, they're, they're open source companies with Apache open source projects at their core, but, uh, but with commercial models around that. And, uh, and Hortonworks, which is a newer entrant, but actually is, is uh, XR, a bunch of XR uh, guys who actually uh, built most of Hadoop, uh, a lot of them. So that's what Hadoop is all about. Uh, instead of the, the old scaling, which was vertical big to throw more and more power at one, one machine and do everything on a single instance, uh, the new scaling, horizontal, shared nothing, uh, data parallel, commodity hardware, embracing failure. Um, why commodity hardware? Well, because it's cheap. You don't want to, you know, you can do massively parallel things, but then, you know, th that's a multi, multi million dollar appliance which gets delivered on a forklift. And, I, I'm, and I'm not joking, uh, into your data center. Uh, whereas, you know, with, with Hadoop, um, you're talking about commodity clusters of machines, uh, shared nothing, it's designed for failure, disk failure, network failure. Uh, memory, anything, nodes getting completely um, you know, cut off, rack failures, data centers blowing up, uh, this thing will just keep going. So a little bit about the architecture. Uh, so you've got two main components, HDFS, which is the uh, distributed file system for storing the files uh, on all these, these different uh, computers in a cluster, and you've got MapReduce, which is uh, the framework uh, for writing applications where, uh, for compute on the, that data. They look kind of similar, and they've got a similar uh, kind of high-level architecture. Um, and often the, these, these, uh, these name node and job tracker demons are actually uh, co-located on, on one master node. So you typically have a master node, um, and HDFS has a name node, which, which is basically responsible for keeping the metadata about where, where all the files are. So they're all split up into um, two blocks. Uh, so each data node uh, has, has a little slice of, of this file. So instead of having you know, one gigantic file, you've got it split up into many, many blocks. The name node keeps track of where all of that is. And that's distributed around all the data nodes. The data nodes are responsible for knowing where that, where that uh, particular block is on the local file system that it's using. Um, now, we're not talking about uh, you know, complicated RAID structures. It's just a bunch of disks. And again, design for failure. Replication comes through software. Um, you know, as you can see there, each block is replicated. So the idea is if you lose a node, then replication uh, means that you've got, uh, you, you've got a backup. And, one, and, and then obviously uh, cluster rebalances to ensure that 
you've got the right amount of replication. So if you, if you say that you want a replication factor of two, you're always going to have two copies of the data. So in a similar way, um, MapReduce has the job tracker, which is a master to master mode kind of configuration. Um, that is responsible for job scheduling and um, and then a bunch of task trackers which are responsible for compute. So you also have uh, data locality, which is important for performance. Um, so instead of uh, a task tracker has now got a piece of work to do uh, on some data, a little computation uh, script. Uh, so instead of just running it against uh, data which is somewhere else in the cluster and incurring network cost, it knows via the name node and the data node exactly where each, each block is and it will go and run its data on, uh, on that um, data node. And you've got various levels, rack, cluster, um, so the data center rack and node locality. So again, designed for failure and fault tolerance, you can lose a task tracker completely, or multiple of them, and another one will just, uh, you, you know, you will have some overall slowdown because that, um, that particular job will have to be restarted, but if it's, uh, the job tracker realizes that it's failed and restarts it on another node. So what is MapReduce, in fact? Um, so who here doesn't know anything about functional programming? All functional programming gurus. <laughs> Fan <laughs> it's fantastic. So, okay, so if you know a bit about functional programming and it's really you know, quite straightforward, um, you've got a map function and a reduce function. So, a map uh, literally maps a function over some data. Say so in Python, you know, you map a function over a list. And reduce um, is, is, a way, is, is effectively an aggregation function. Uh, you know, you're taking uh, two values and, and uh, combining them in some way. Um, and obviously, you've got more complicated. Uh, functional constructs like fold and so on, but you can express a lot uh, in, in just you know, this map reduce paradigm. So that's exactly what map reduce is. It's, it's, a, it's a map phase where you map a function over each block. In fact, most of the time, let's say you're dealing with text, it's each line in the text file. Um, then there's some shuffling in the middle, and you then apply a, a, a reduce phase, um, and you get a final result. So in the, uh, the canonical example is always word count. So here we start with a bunch of lines, each with you know, of text. Uh, the map phase uh, splits each line into its component uh, token, words, and then emits a word and, and, and just simply the number one. So now we've got, you know, we started with the files all over uh, the cluster which have lines of text. We now split them up into these, these uh, key value pairs. Um, we shuffle them so that uh, MapReduce ensures that every, uh, uh, one reducer will, will see all the values for a given key, which means that you know, a certain reducer will see bare, will see all the values for bare, and that means that it can keep an in-memory state that says, I've seen one, now I add another, and another, and another, and I split out bare two, uh, car three, and so on. Uh, and then you, know, sort, you sort by accounts, and then you get, uh, you get your result. Okay. Unfortunately, I'm gonna show you a bit of Java. Sorry about that. Um, <laughs> But don't worry, we'll get to the good stuff soon. This is really to, uh, to, make, it, to make it better. Um, so, yeah, as, uh, as Scalding GitHub says, Hadoop is a distributed system for counting words um, because you always see the word count. Um, so this is to give you an idea about why, why Spark um, and, and Python and, and Scala and so on on Spark uh, are so great, one of the reasons. Um, this is you know, the, the raw MapReduce API in Java. Um, and I've tried to highlight where things are actually happening, you know, where, you know, what's not boilerplate. Uh, you know, each one of those words uh, is being split with, a, you know, with some tokenizer, which is just very simply white space or something. Um, you know, the purple is your map function, and then you're emitting word in one. That's it, right? That's the core of what we're doing. It's really, really simple. But, it, but obviously, you've got to wade through lines and lines of, of uh, boilerplate there. Similarly, with reduce, the green is the reduce function. Um, you're getting all the keys for, uh, uh, sorry, all the values for each key, and you're literally just summing them up in the local variable and spitting out the result, right? Really, really straightforward, but again, higher exceptions and interrupted exceptions and classes extending generic, I mean, it's, it's a nightmare, right? And then just to run a, a job, you know, you've got to put something together like this um, with a lot of reflection and, uh, and things go wrong, and it's, so it's, it's, it's ugly, um, and I've, 
unfortunately written many, many, many of these in, in my previous life, and it's, uh, yeah, it's just not pretty. So Hadoop um, comes with something called streaming, which, uh, which is built on top of the, the normal MapReduce API, and it allows you to run an, any arbitrary script that reads in from standard input uh, your data, these, literally these lines, um, and then you know, writes everything out to standard out. So you take that, that, map, that map class set up in Java, and you have a map uh, script in Python, um, and similarly for reduce. So this is a little better, right? This is what you all love. Um, I've highlighted in red the standard in, standard out thing because it's a bit painful. Um, but it's really, really simple, right? Uh, the, the, the purple is your map function. For every line in your standard in, which is your you know, lines of text, do something. Apply a, apply a function, that's map. Um, and you know, we strip it, we split it, and for each word we emit uh, one. So exactly the same as what we were doing in the in the diagram and exactly the same as what we're doing in Java, but obviously just in Python. But that, uh, the, the reduce function again reads from standard in, does exactly the same thing. So green is, is the kind of reduce function that we're going to be running, uh, which is the code subsequent. Um, and again, for every line that we, that we get in standard in, now these are key value pairs, normally separated by, let's say, a tab character, so word and one. Um, we, we then just do a split um, <coughs> and we sum up the words. So I've, I've left, there's a bit more um, going on in the script, but I've, I've uh, kind of just highlighted the, the, main, the main event, which is you know, we, wanna, we want to sum up the, current, the, the count and emit word and, and count. Uh, and there's your job setup. Uh, you know, you, you've got to specify a, a path, a mapper, um, you know, a path to the reducer, your input and your output, and so on. So that looks a little bit better, a, a little better, right? I mean, we're using Python, it's great, but we're still kind of, um, you know, it's still very error prone, right? I mean, we, we're reading from standard in, you know, it's difficult to debug, it's difficult to debug locally. Um, you know, you, you might have different situation locally than on the cluster. Um, it, it, it's, it's not, it's, it's a lot better, but it's not that pretty. Uh, so what's great about Hadoop? Uh, it is very, very reliable. Um, you know, Yahoo runs 40,000, more than 40,000 nodes in production. Um, you know, probably the, and the, uh, Facebook runs, Twitter runs, Google runs, well, they run MapReduce less and less. Um, pretty much every big web company, data-related company, telcos, you know, they, they're running Hadoop. Uh, so it's very, very reliable uh, in the face of failure. You, know, you can, you can if, you, if you've got a multi-data center Hadoop cluster, you can literally lose an entire data center. Got high availability for the master node. Things just get replicated. Um, it's pretty, um, you know, it, it, it's really, really uh, tolerant. But obviously, it's got a terrible API. You can agree on that. Um, you've got to do disk I/O for every job. So there's no, there's no concept of caching. You know, every time you read something, you've got to read it. Uh, you know, uh, you've got to read it off disk, write it back out to disk. So those intermediate steps. You've got a map phase, reading from disk. Do your, uh, your map computation, your function, write it out to disk, read it back on the reducers, and you've got this network shuffle, and then finally write it out to disk again. So there's a lot of disk I.O., uh, a lot of job setup, um, overhead, very, very uh, slow, and really terrible to, to debug. So if you want to use Python, um, you know, it's, it's even harder to debug this thing than if you're using just the Java or the API. So why Spark? Right. Um, many, many reasons. These are a few of them. So Spark is built from scratch, from the ground up, to support um, very, very fast jobs and in-memory caching. So uh, low latency job startup, in-memory caching, which means it's fast, especially for iterative algorithms or for situations where you're querying the same data again and again. Uh, so exploratory analytics, uh, SQL, and so on. Uh, you, you know, you've got, you've got really nice primitives like broadcast variables, again, very useful for machine learning. They've got a, uh, an abstraction called a resilient distributed data set. So instead of just having files on disk, um, you, you now have something called an RDD, uh, which, has, which, which keeps the, uh, the, the graph the, of, um, of all the phases and the operations that are applied to it. So if, if anything fails, that data set, or pieces of it, uh, blocks of it and partitions of it, can actually be recomputed re on, on the fly. And you also have replication of, a, of an RDD, so uh, you, 
can set a replication factor in Spark and it'll be copied to somewhere else in the node. If a node goes down, it doesn't even have to recompute it. You can just know that it's there. But if you do need to, you can recompute it on the fly. So together with caching, this means that in the face of failure, you don't, you know, number one, it's, it's as fault tolerant as the loop. So it's very similar fault tolerance characteristics, um, but it's much, much faster to recover in failure. Fully Hadoop compatible. So uh, Spark is written in, um, in Scala. Uh, fully interoperable, interoperable with with, the, with Java. So any Hadoop compatible file system uh, or input source, data source can be read in Spark, uh, and that now includes Python. So you can read any uh, Hadoop uh, input system. So you know, these big data stores, Cassandra, HBase, um, you know, Couchbase, Elasticsearch. Uh, you can now read in Python too. That's that's kind of recent functionality that uh, that I. That I con contributed to the project. Um, it's got a very rich API, so we're, which we'll see in a second, um, and, and it's functional in nature. So it really um, it, it revolves around operations that you apply to data sets, map and flat map and reduce um, group buys. You know, so it, it gives you a very rich API, whereas uh, the standard Hadoop API is just extremely. Um, and then finally, one platform for multiple use cases. So uh, Spark. Core is flexible enough to, to support um, SQL on Spark via Spark SQL, uh, Spark Streaming, which is streaming data processing, MLLib, which is machine learning, uh, graph processing with graphics, and there's you know, more and more components that are being added all the time. So this is the word count in Spark. There it is, right, a few lines. So you read something from your, your distributed file system, your text file, um, you have a flat map function, so you, you, know, you apply this function and split every line. Uh, you then apply another function, and these are all pipelines, by the way, so there's no kind of overhead of, of having multiple phases, um, where you just take each word in, in a stream of words and you, emit, you append a one to the emit key value pairs, and then you just reduce by key. You know, for each key, you sum up the values, and you're done. Right? Much cleaner, you know, much closer to, the, to, what, to what's actually going on, um, less boilerplate. Um, and what's more, you know, you don't have to worry about debugging this on a, on, on a local machine versus on a cluster. You, you know, this is all you change. You just, uh, instead of pointing it to your local uh, threaded uh, instance of Spark, uh, you just point it to your thousand node cluster um, and away you go. Same code, nothing changes. Okay, so the functional API, um, again, you know, Functional Python versus functional PySpark, very, very similar. You would use list comprehensions to do, you know, to solve some problems in, um, in Python. Uh, so the, you know, I've tried to kind of highlight where they're similar. Uh, the orange is the flat map and, and the purple is the map function. So, so you, that one list comprehension is, is kind of two functions there in, in Spark. Um, and a group by with a sort um, is, is, is essentially a, uh, and obviously the length is essentially a reduced by key. So if you're familiar with functional, you know, functional programming in Python, uh, the concepts of Spark are very easy to learn because they're effectively the same. Where you would do something like a list comprehension, you just have a map or a flat map in Spark. Um, and again, you're just mapping up <coughs> over a collection of data, which to you looks like a list effectively. So caching is, a, is, a, you know, is one of the most important parts of, of Spark, what, ma what, what makes it great. Um, you know, you're going to do, let's say, logistic regression you know, in, in Python, um, and we're going to do 100 iterations over, over a billion rows of data. Right? If you're going to read the data from disk every, every iteration, it's going to be very expensive. Here, we, we, we have a text file, we parse out our data, we create um, a, a point, uh, or a bunch of NumPy vectors, uh, we cache that data. So the first time it's read off of disk uh, in the cluster, but it's loaded into memory. So every subsequent iteration hits memory instead of disk. We don't have to worry about reading it. Um, and is you know, 100 times faster. Um, so for things that are iterative, like machine learning, which is, some, you know, which is what I do, uh, it's great. And you know, so instead of waiting hours, you can wait minutes. And of course, it, you know, it, fully, it integrates fully with every Python library that, that is out there. So you can, you, know, you can literally just drop in whatever you want, NumPy, SciPy, any library you want. Uh, so, for example, you can use scikit uh, 
uh, dash learn instead of your own custom code to do some machine learning. Just uh, drop in a classifier with stochastic gradient descent, uh, cache the data obviously, you know, and, and there's the code that you can use to train it. And that works. You, know, you, you, map, um, you map the train function of your data, uh, you reduce it by merging models together, and you, um, your end result is an average of the model from each node. Done. A few lines. Now, now, you know, now you can run, uh, your, your build your ad targeting models over 20 billion you know, records of ad data if you want. So Spark SQL is a SQL component quite new to the project, but it's, it's effectively completely language integrated. So you can take a standard RDD of, uh, of data, these are rows, uh, records, you, m you um, map them and, and extract a row with fields. So now you kind of like a struct type, uh, type object, um, a SQL row, really. Uh, and then you just uh, you get Spark to infer the schema, you register it as a table, uh, events that's highlighted, and then you can just run uh, SQL within your Spark, uh, your, your PySpark uh, Py console or, or program. Um, but that, what, what comes back is, is again an RDD. So you can interleave uh, any complex uh, you know, Python, pure Python logic that you want. Uh, you can drop in some SQL when it suits, and then you can continue with your, your funky PySpark logic or your machine learning or whatever you want. So you know, it integrates completely into the actual language. So yeah, I'm kind of, uh, kind of running here, but um, a, a little bit about PySpark internals. I won't spend too much time on it, um, but you know, you've got a similar setup to something like Hadoop. You've got a master node and a bunch of slaves. Um, but obviously, you, do, you don't want to go and rewrite the whole of uh, Spark job scheduling and, and infrastructure, thousands and thousands of lines of code, uh, Scala code in Python. Uh, so what you do is you use Py4j to interrupt with uh, the JVM. Uh, you spin up a, you know, your local Spark context. Um, it talks to a, a Java Spark context um, through a socket. Um, and then for any large data transfer between those, you actually use a file system because it's much faster. Um, and then you, you know, you've, got a, you've got all your workers in your cluster, which are themselves are Java processes. They spin up a, a Python subprocess, uh, Python workers, and your, you know, all your functions and your lambdas and, and your code uh, is, is, is just pickled, shifted across the, to the cluster to those workers and then run over the data uh, and, and back. So you try and do as much of the, of the kind of heavy lifting actually in, on the Java side over the raw, raw bytes as possible, including shuffling sorting and things like that. Um, and just trying to run the actual kind of uh, functions that you want you know, on the Python side. Um, this obviously gets quite complicated, um, so I can talk a little bit more about it, but uh, that's just to give you a kind of an idea. So all of this works um, in the console, uh, which I'll hopefully show you. Um, so you can you know, Python and all that interactivity that you want uh, just works. So unfortunately, you know, Python is, is, is a first-class citizen in, in the Spark world, um, but because of this, this overhead between Scala and Java and writing files and so on, it, it, it is invariably going to be a little bit slower. So it is slow, but it's improving all the time, and the latest release and, and the master branch contain numerous uh, performance improvements. Um, not quite at feature parity, but we're pretty much there in Spark core. A big one that's just come out now this pull request is to add stream, full streaming support for PySpark, which wasn't there before. Um, so streaming is a whole other talk, and again, happy to to talk about it um, uh, offline. But effectively, you know, we're, we're, we're Spark Core is, uh, is doing batch computation on static immutable data. Streaming is uh, is computing on massive data streams as the data comes in. Uh, that was that was not available in Python until now. So that should be any minute. Uh, I'm out for time. Yeah. 15 minutes, okay. So I've kind of flown through all of that. Um, try to give you a, a, a quick taste about you know, the cutting edge of big data processing, um, Spark, and PySpark. Uh, I could talk a lot, about, a lot more about it offline, but I really wanted to try and uh, show um, a little bit of a demo because that's always obviously more interesting than me droning on. So, am I connected to you? Sorry. I'm going to 
be able to get this to you. That'll take a little while. Um, okay, so I, I just set up a cluster in Amazon just to show you guys uh, what it's all about. That's connected, and then I'm running a, an IPython uh, notebook server on the, uh, on the master node. So let's see what we've got here. Um, Okay, so we have got uh, one master, five slaves. Uh, each slave has uh, four cores, and uh, it should have uh, like 30 gigs of memory, I think. Yeah. So we've got 140 gig of memory on this cluster. Not too bad. Um, so I've already um, I've already done some work to to cache one of the data sets see that it takes a while, so I didn't want to do it live. Um, but this is what it looks like, you know. Um, all I did was start the, the notebook server. It's obviously, I used the Spark scripts to set up a cluster in EC2, which you can do. Um, and it's all, you know, it's all automated and done for me. It's all ready to go. Um, I launch a little Spark context with this code um, and, and get my SQL. I'm going to show you a bit of just the SQL stuff here. I get the SQL context. That is a, a path to S3, so it contains about 125 gigs of data, 750 million odd rows. Um, and you can see the first line, um, it's, you know, it's, it's user visit data from, from some data set, I actually can't quite recall now. But you know, you've got IP address, you've got a, uh, an ID there, uh, a date, um, I think it's some ad revenue, user agent, a country, and so on and so on. So that's a CSE. I'm going to just apply my, my function to split that, split it up, and now each row is a list, list of strings. So now I can convert that to, and I'm just going to just extract uh, only a few of the columns, let's say, so um, just to illustrate. Uh, so, I, so I extract the, you know, the visit date, ad revenue, uh, the country, and the search term, as an example, uh, into a Spark SQL row object. Uh, which is the ad revenue, you can see the first. So you can inspect, you know, without uh, triggering a computation on the entire data set, which is quite big and takes some time, uh, you can expect, you know, can kind of peek at it and, and take uh, the first row or the first few rows, and that will actually just go and fetch the data from wherever it is and send it back to you uh, without you having to, you know, to wait 30 minutes. So there we, we inferred our schema, so we just said, uh, you know, to uh, Spark SQL, what does this look like? I mean, it's pretty obvious, you know, we told it here yeah, the fields, but there it is, you know. Uh, it, it does it automatically. It tells us we've got, you know, a double and some string fields, you know, what to do. This works for JSON, by the way, so you can just throw JSON at uh, Spark SQL if you need to um, We then register it as a temporary table, and we tell Spark to cache it. So that is just a flag. It says, I want this table cached. It doesn't mean that instantaneously it's in memory. You still have to read it into memory, right? Which is exactly what uh, happens next. Um, you know, any any operation that um, that triggers uh, an action, uh, so something like a, a reduce uh, account, something like that, um, will, you know, that'll trigger a job on the on the cluster. So you can see here, you know, I said count equals that SQL. That's that's the language integrated uh, SQL query. You know, select count one from visits. Uh, that that variable itself is actually is actually a it's, it's all lazy so it's not actually triggered yet uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's another RDD um, but if I then do um, you know, if I time the, the, the collect which says trigger that computation and bring me back all the results then it's going to run 
Now, I was, I was trying to get it to run so I, you could see the times, but um, I'm not going to do it live because obviously it takes a, a huge amount of time. But you can see here, I've got all the, uh, I've, I've got some of the jobs that we're running, um, and that is it there. So it's got about 2,000, I think it's 2,000 partitions. It took 28 minutes to read 120 gigabytes of data from S3. So that's in including the network cost of putting it from Amazon storage system into the cluster. Um, but then obviously it was cached. Uh, so we didn't cache all 120 gigs. We just we, um, took a few uh, columns. So we can actually see that. Um, sorry, you can see that here. So we can see that uh, you know, we've got an RDD uh, with those columns, and it takes up, you know, there's all the partitions, it takes out about, about 30 gigs in memory. So you know, I haven't stressed the cluster or anything, but just for illustrative purposes. So to read all of that data, it took 30 minutes initially to load it into memory. Um, and we would expect, you know, so if, if we were to do a count, no matter how many rows, it still has to do, uh, sorry, columns, it still has to do a full table scan. We'd expect that we did it from scratch again. It would take 28, 29, 30 minutes, depending on a few factors. So, uh, yeah, you can see that's how long it took. So, I'm just going to do that again live right now. Hopefully, this works. So, six seconds to count 750 million rows. Not too bad, I would say. So let's do something. You know, uh, that's, that's, that's just, uh, I had those images just in case the internet connection didn't work, so I could show you. <laughs> so we'll do something like a little bit sort of trickier. Uh, yeah, not much trickier, but something that involves um, a bit of aggregation and uh, you know, select countries some add revenue. So this is kind of like the word count. You know, for each for each country, we're going to sum up some stuff. So it involves the full map phase. It involves a shuffle. It involves a sort. Uh, it involves a reduce and then kind of a final output. So we we'll wait for you know. So we expect it to take a little bit longer. It's scanning, you know, it's aggregating 750 million rows down to however many countries there are and summing up the revenue. But uh, it should take 30 seconds, I think. Have a look. Yeah, there you go. So 36 seconds to do. You know, it's not the, the not the most complex aggregation in the world, but it's. It had to do a bit of uh, a bit of work there. Uh, and we see we've got 95, 95 countries in this particular data set. So you know we could obviously we could do you know uh, add revenue by IP address, and that would end up with something like two hundred and fifty million groups, something like that, uh, or two hundred million, um, which which would probably crash the, the iPython console if I try to collect it all. Um, but we could do that, and you know it would take a little bit longer, but not significantly. Uh, and then, you know, finally, again, because this is just Python, uh, fully interactive, we've, we've just processed 750 million rows um, on our cluster, but now we've brought back those 95 rows, and we want to do the normal stuff with it. So this is not you know, nearly as kind of fancy and, uh, and good-looking as the, the previous one, but, uh, you know, we can do the, the normal stuff. Uh, you know, we can collect that. We can use pandas, uh, create a data frame for our, for our rows. We can display it in a nice sort of format. At the first um, first few rows and see okay I have no idea what country that is but that's got the most revenue um, and then finally you know, matplotlib in our iPython console plot the data you know. so we've pretty much gone from from start to finish a uh, few cells and we've done you know, we've computed an aggregation over seven million rows of data in uh, 30 seconds and plotted it um, and that's it. That's pretty much all I have. Um, I will just finish off by saying that um, you know, Spark's come a long way in the last uh, in the last couple of years. I've been involved in the project for about two odd years, so it's come all the way from sort of 0 0.5, 0 0.6 when I was working with it initially, through to most recent release 1.1.0. It's supported by all the main Hadoop uh, competitor uh, uh, companies. It really is the next generation of big data, in my view. 
Um, although the next generation of big data probably come from Slack. <laughs> Um, and Databricks uh, is the company, it's like the cloud era of Spark, they spun themselves out of uh, Berkeley uh, and they offer you know, training and, and they've got a product, product called Databricks Cloud which they demoed in at the, at a, the Spark Summit in, uh, in June in, in San Francisco. So a very cool demo, I'd encourage you to go check it out uh, and try it for yourself. You, know, you can download a pre-built uh, package, by binaries, um, run it on your, your laptop, play around with it, uh, run it on the iPad console, um, and if you, you know, if, if you've got an Amazon account uh, or, or Google App Engine, you know, I think it's uh, Google Cloud Compute, I think there's some scripts for it. You can spin up a, you know, a five node, 150 gig cluster and play with it. Um, to give you an idea, I used uh, Spot instances, uh, Amazon Spot instances to run those five nodes. Um, so you know, four processes, 30 gigs of each, they cost uh, nine cents an hour, nine US cents an hour. So to run that for 24 hours, $10. Not, not too expensive. Uh, yeah, that's it. Thanks for listening. Um, yeah, there's my email if you want. Oh, oh. It's gone. Um, yeah, time delayed. There's my email if you want to drop me a line, chat about Spark, ask questions, happy to do more offline. Been, you know, it's, a, it's kind of a whirl, a whirlwind to try and get through it all. And I, I, haven't even, I feel like I haven't scratched the surface. Um, but yeah, happy to, to talk more um, offline. Can we thank Nick? Questions? Um, yeah, I noticed that it, it's it's always text going in. Is there any way to get something like numeric directly? In, um, say, for example, any other formats other than text like H5 or anything like that? Or is uh, you, you mean as input? Yeah. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, text is always easier. <coughs> demo uh, and it's kind of what works out the box. Um, I'm not sure about H5 or PAN, but I mean, well, just as an example, I just anything other than sure. As an example, um, so I reuse Elasticsearch for all our uh, data storage and indexing. So uh, we pull data from Elasticsearch into Spark, um, and Elasticsearch has a, um, a it's called a Hadoop input format API. So it's just an API that you code against, and you can just drop it into Hadoop or Spark and say. You know, all you define is, um, is some configuration and how you actually read data out of that data source. So that data source could be, so let's say, Elasticsearch, um, which would you know, come back as, uh, as a dictionary of, of type data. So it would be strings, numbers, a date time, you know, whatever you have, uh, arrays, nested, nested data. You know, that, it could be HBase, it could be MySQL, it could be uh, Cassandra, it could be pretty much any kind of big data store you can think of. They've all got wrappers or, or formats that allow you to both read and write data. Um, so some of the work that I did uh, recently in Spark is exactly that. Um, before all of this, this custom data sources were only available in Java and Java. Now they're available in Python, so it, read, it literally reads the data from Java, converts it into pic, uh, pickles it using um, PyroLite, and then you know, really can access it in Python. Um, so you know you could write your own custom data sources, obviously. Uh, there are there are data sources that support data formats like Parquet and, and so on that support uh, numeric data arrays. So H5 and HD5, I, um, I don't know offhand if there's something like that. Oh, I, I was more asking about what you've already answered. No. Right. So yeah, it's very flexible. And if you can read it in, if, you, if you've got a Hadoop input format for it, you can read it. I might have asked you this, but maybe uh, someone here, I mean, your data seems to be there already. So I've got like two or four, two to four terabytes of data now that I got yesterday that I either need to buy a big server. So I've got 50,000 rand for my boss to do that. It's stupid. Or I can follow this approach, but I still need to upload it there. And I sure. can't find, Afrio says no, blah, blah, blah. So if anybody can just point me to where can I upload large amounts of data directly. Yeah, look, I, mean, I think if you're going to try and upload two rates. terabytes over the wire, then... Yes, that I know, but I'd like to avoid that. Um, uh, so <laughs> with the post office being the way it is. <laughs> <laughs> so we're, you know, we're lucky, and, and, uh, and I think people overseas are lucky in that a lot of people are hosted, a lot of startups, a lot of big companies are hosted in Amazon or Google or whatever or their data centers and transferring data between them you know, is expensive, but it's not as bad as, yeah, the as our poor network. So your option is to build your own cluster. Yeah. Instead of buying one massive node, go and buy five smaller ones. Yes. 
build your own cluster and then you know, pull the data from the files. At Amazon, we actually have a, an option where you can ship your hard drive or your DVDs to America. I can't do it from Cape Town, maybe. No. <laughs> Amazon refuses to open a. a a data center. In so there's a business case here for a little box where you plug in a USB drive and you put in your credit card. And it, just <laughs> <laughs> it takes care of your problem. Yeah, look, care 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 care. Care. <laughs> like the old phone booths, so just replace them. USB booths. So the catching there, it seems like it's a great tool to put your data in the cloud. But does it warn you when you're hitting your limits of the memory? Does it memory map it to drive disk without failing? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so. It's, that's also come a long way. Uh, you know, initially it was a pretty basic thing like, okay, it's, 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 the data is either cached in memory or it's not. Um, and obviously that leads to problems. You know, we all know that Java can be a bit poor with memory management and so on. So, um, you know, if, if you start running out of memory, then you get uh, garbage collection pauses and your cluster goes down and all kinds of stuff. So in the old days, that was a problem. It's gotten a lot better. So th there are different uh, levels of caching. You can cache everything um, in memory or nothing. You can spill it to disk, so you part as much as possible in memory and then uh, and then disk. And it's a kind of a, a last in, uh, first out, or first in, first, first out kind of uh, arrangement where if you're trying to cache data and there's, there's too much stuff there already, it'll evict data uh, to make room for the new stuff. So it tries to kind of manage that. Uh, but yeah, you can spill it to disk, you can, you can cache in disk only, so, um, so that'll write to disk. So for example, if you're putting from Amazon S3, you don't want to pay the network cost every time, but you may not want to cache all the data. Which you, uh, on, in memory, you might want to cache it on local, and it'll do that. So it'll be, you still pay I/O, but it'll be faster, for example. Um, but overall, it's become a lot better at, um, at sort of telling you um, that, or showing you when the memory pressure is increasing and when you're trying to, you're trying to run, you're starting to run out, and also not dying when you do. Um, but it's an ongoing problem. It's, an, it's a problem for Hadoop too. Uh, not the, the memory part, but tuning this, the system. I mean, it's a very, you know, you're talking about distributed system. I mean, I showed you a small cluster. Production clusters are 1,000 nodes, you know, uh, 500 nodes, 1,000 nodes. Uh, so tuning production jobs at that scale with terabytes of memory in a cluster uh, is tricky. But, uh, but generally, there are different uh, levels of caching. Yeah. I have one more. Sure. Um, <laughs> one you, you mentioned the, the caching, and you basically constructing a pipeline. Um, does the cache and validation, is it, is it easy? Does it just compute shards along the way, or that, would you have to do that yourself? Um, so so the, the data that, I mean, the, when you cache the data in, in memory, so if you say you want an RDB, you know, a, a variable that points to an RDB is always a representation at that time. In a way. So, so let's say, for example, you load, you, you know, load something from, from a text, text file, you apply some functions to, you know, to split it out and convert those, let's say, into numbers, and then a vector. Do you then call, so, so now, you know, that might actually literally include variable assignments that you get. You know, text is this, uh, lines or rows is this, um, vector is this. If you call cache on the vector, obviously, it's, it's, it's just going to cache that data set. Um, but it knows how to reconstruct that vector that is the node pipeline that first you read off uh, uh, this on text, uh, then you did this, then you did this. So what will happen is um, when you when you hit one of the earlier RDBs again, let's say you, you say text file or count or something like that, it's not going to use the cache data, it will go to that uh, the original one and you're going to pay the, the IO cost again. If you hit the, that vector uh, data set which is cached, it will just hit that and get out of memory. If one of those uh, partitions um, fails of that cache data set, it will recompute it knowing that, okay, it only needs to read that partition uh, in that location because it keeps a record of where every uh, partition is located uh, on, on, in the file system. So it reads that, that one that failed back, applies the transformations, and then recaches. So that's what will happen. And if, if one you node know, goes down and a few partitions, you know, it's Does that answer the question? Kind of, I was just thinking like an appending log file. You know. So what I'd say is, is that uh, these systems that you can start computed are not, they are not um, transactional processing systems. Right? They, they, sure. they deal with mutable data. 
the pen is fine. Typically, you can do a union. So there's, okay, you've got an RDD. Let's say you, you, you've got the, uh, the previous 30 days of data in memory, and you now want to append the current, thing, uh, current day. You just you can, you know, do union, and then you've got 31 days. But saying, oh, I want to update that, that day, that just doesn't work. So right. you know, the assumption is that RDDs are reusable, so you can create them. You can append to them, but you can can I kind of just change the uh, what they Okay, that's fine for two. Cool. Uh, we'll take both our speakers one more time.